Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Good to see you all, smiling faces. <clears throat> well, brethren, <clears throat> I think we would all agree that we're living in a time that is not good, just to put it succinctly. There's many things in our lives, collectively and individually, that is not good. We got natural disasters, deadly pandemics, drug addiction, abortion, child abuse. That's just to name a few. I could go on and on. But we're well aware of how bad things have gotten in this society. Perhaps that's why some consider Romans 8:28, which Brenda just read for us, to be the most quote quoted verse in the Bible. Just to Reiterate it again, it's Romans 8, 28. And we know <clears throat> that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, the promise of good in the face of evil brings a hope where often, without this assurance from God, there is no hope at all. That's why I really feel, you know, for people who have, do not have the hope that we have in God, that do not have that assurance, that do not believe in God or trust his promises, I don't know how those people continue to go on. And this, I mean, life is just, I mean, you just open a newspaper, you turn on the television, and it's just one evil thing after another. But we have to admit that sometimes reconciling what is happening in our lives with the beauty of that promise can be challenging. Because we've all experienced, I believe, a prayer that seemed to go unanswered, a healing perhaps that didn't come. Or a dream that's left behind as our lives took another path. For some, this seeming contradiction can lead to disappointment or maybe even anger at God who didn't keep his promise. Or maybe he did. Maybe the contradiction, brethren, exists because we don't really understand the promise. That's what I'd like to look to today. I would like to examine that promise. And the best way, I think, to start is to put this verse in its proper context. You know, we often want to take a verse out of, uh, and isolate it and to say something, but that's often a very big mistake because we need to look at the context, what the author was trying to say to his audience at that historical period, at that time. And then we can glean what God wants us to understand. This, the letter of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul to introduce himself prior to his upcoming first visit. And he wanted the Romans... He wanted the church there to understand his positions on faith, on grace, on salvation, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit before he arrived, hopefully to build support among the believers and unify what was at that time a seriously divided church. And if we look at Romans as a whole, we find that much of it, especially chapter 8, is, feel, is filled with contradiction or juxtaposition would maybe be a better word, as Paul juxtaposes a life of the selfish pursuits of the flesh with one focused on walking in accordance with the righteousness of God. Now this letter was written in the late 40s to 50s A.D. And if we look historically at that time, 
we find that in Rome during that time, we find great persecution, or the beginning of persecution, certainly, of both Jews and Christians under the Emperor Nero. Now, although Paul speaks at length of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit and the carnal mind versus the life-giving uh, spiritual mind, he goes on to remind the Romans that as believers, they are indwelt, and, and, and reminds us as well, I should add, that we, they, and we are indwelt by the same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead. And brethren, that is a powerful partner. That is a powerful instrument in our struggles with temptation. Notice Romans 8, verse 11. Romans 8, verse 11. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul writes, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if that's the case, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit which dw who dwells in you. That's an awesome power to have at our disposal, brethren. And a promise of the down payment of eternal life. But then he goes on to say in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now what did that mean to that audience at that time? What were the sufferings they were undergoing? Well, we, I already mentioned that the persecutions of both Jews and Christians began under Nero. And I believe that this verse is an allusion to the struggle beyond their own personal battle with sin to the terror of Roman persecution. How bad was that persecution? Well... Nero was known to affix Christians and Jews to poles in his garden, drench them in tar, 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 and set them ablaze to provide light for his evening strolls. We can't, I mean, you know, your mind just boggles at how much cruelty that entails. But that's what they were dealing with. And it's in this context that Paul makes his declaration in verse 28. And we know, he says, no uncertainty here, no guesswork. He goes on to say that God causes all things to work. Not just some things, or just things that we can understand or in which we can see the benefit together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. His purpose. And what is that purpose? Verse 29 tells us, here's His purpose for our calling. For those whom He foreknew, He, all, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. That, brethren, is an awesome statement. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that God's purpose for us and what we go through is so that we can be transformed into the image of his Son, become a very member of the God family, so that Jesus Christ can call us brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. Now, it's not unusual to hear the testimony of believers for whom this promise has become a reality. When dealing with some difficult situation or condition with family or in the workplace, they were filled with dread and 
were uncertain that no good could come out of this. Because they don't, they see with limited vision, you see. And then suddenly God moved and the situation was miraculously turned for their benefit. You see, brethren, because the reality is that God loves us passionately and often keeps his promise on a very intimate and personal level. But his purpose, the good that he promises, does not mean, let me say this, his purpose, the good that he promises, does not mean that we will always acquire what we want, or what we desire. But rather, brethren, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that through all our circumstances, the will of God will be accomplished. His plans will not be thwarted. And we will be transformed into the very image through our suffering and our heart's desires changed to align with His. And there is no greater good than that. Now, the concept, this concept of suffering of the righteous has, has for millennia, thousands of years, been a topic of discussion among the rabbinic sages of Israel, as it has been also in the, in the Christian community. The question of why evil befalls God's people, quite frankly, is a difficult one to answer. And the, the rabbinic commentary on Jewish uh, tradition and scripture, the Talmud, records a wide variety of suggested reasons. But as a whole, they recognize that God allows suffering in difficult circumstances that are not a, some penalty for anything that we've done or the result of sin, but rather for the purpose of bringing blessing to the individual and often greater good, uh, uh, good to the community at large. And they've called such actions on God's part the sufferings of love. I like that. The sufferings of love. These are those difficult circumstances God uses to transform his people into his image. I'd like to now look at some bi biblical examples where this is be completely evident. For example, Job and Joseph are two examples if we need to discuss the, uh, the nature of this, of this idea. You see, both men were innocent and godly, and yet both were victims of untold suffering. In Job's case as we're finding out in our Bible study, he lost everything, including his children, his wealth, his health, only to have his wealth restored and the blessing of a new family given to him after a remarkable encounter with God himself. Clearly, the Lord worked all of Job's suffering together for his good on a personal level, giving him a new and deeper understanding of God's sovereign love. Joseph's story is a bit different. As a young man, dearly beloved by his father, the favorite of his father, as a matter of fact, he has a, what's called an idyllic life in the hills around Hebron. But young Joseph's sufferings were immense. He was betrayed by his brothers, torn from his father, sold into slavery, and dragged from his beloved homeland to a foreign soil and an alien people. And it, it really is hard to imagine, I think, how he was able to bear the pain and fear that must have overtaken him. I mean, in the bottom of that dark well, calling out to his brothers while they ate a meal 
nearby. Then to be taken from that well only to find himself in slavery. And then ultimately to Egypt where he was put into the servitude of Potiphar. But on a personal level, God certainly used that suffering for Joseph's good, placing him as second in command over all of Egypt and blessing him with a family of his own. That's a rags-to-riches story if there ever was one. This, the miraculous was Joseph's constant companion in Egypt and an, ever re, an ever-present reminder of the faithfulness of God. But not only was Job's suffering used to bless him in a personal sense, but it would also work, work together for good on the universal level. The future of the Israelite people and the path that they were ordained to follow to fulfill their destiny. And it also saved countless lives, both the Israelite lives as well as the Egyptian lives, as well as the lives of the surrounding nations in the area. Yes, his brother's actions were meant for evil. But God worked them together for the good of all mankind. Notice Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. At the very end, after his father had died, his brothers were again so worried that Joseph now, after his father was out of the way, would take revenge on them for what they had done to him as that young boy in Hebron. And he answers them and says, Genesis 50, chapter, tw- uh, chapter 50, verse 20. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're right. You were guilty. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You see, Joseph finally saw the end result. But all the time that he was in that well, all the time that he served Potiphar, all the time then that he was in jail, in confinement in Egypt, and it was years, his faith in God never wavered. And God's purpose was accomplished. Another example is found in Exodus chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 11. This is the story of Jochebed, Moses' mother. Let's look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. Exodus 2, verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. Okay? Now let's look at Hebrews 11, verse 23. Hebrews 11, verse 23. Hebrews eleven twenty three. By faith, Moses, when he was born... Now, wait a minute. Moses didn't have faith when he was born. Whose faith is it talking about here? Jochebed's and Amran. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child... And they were not afraid of the king's edict. They weren't afraid because they had faith. 
History reveals that Jochebed was of the tribe of Levi, as was her husband Amram. And Jewish has, the Jews have a tradition that tells us that Jochebed and Amram were familiar, familiar with the prophecies that God had given concerning a deliverer. And I certainly think Hebrew bears that out. The, Hebrew, the uh, Hebrews bears that out because they said, by faith. What did they have faith in? They had faith in God and his promises of a deliverer. They had strong faith in God and did not fear the edicts of Pharaoh, believing that God would have them give birth to a son. Now we've noticed, I don't, uh, if, if you, we read those verses again, we notice that both in Exodus and Hebrews, it remarks on Moses' beauty. And I'm sure he was a, an attractive little baby, but the Hebrew word means physical beauty, but it includes an inherent strength, goodness, and pleasantness. For Jochebed, surrendering, surrendering her child to the waters of the Nile was pain that I can't imagine she could probably scarcely bear. And her circumstances, quite frankly, could have easily overwhelmed her. A female slave with no rights or privileges at the mercy of slave masters who would have killed Moses in an instant had they known about him. Remember, this is the time when, after the, after the midwives uh, refused to follow Pharaoh's orders and throw, uh, uh, kill the, all the male children that they birthed or helped birth, that Pharaoh put out an edict for all of Egypt, all the population of Egypt, to throw any Hebrew baby, male child, into the Nile River. And I'm sure quite a few died that way. So here she was, putting this child into the Nile in, a, in an, a basket with, pitched with tar and bitumen. But in the months leading up to this, in holding Moses, feeding him, and loving him, a bond was formed that made surrendering him to an unknown future almost unbearable. Yet God worked a situation for her good on a personal level, bringing her baby back into her home and her life for several years as she nursed him. Because remember the story? Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses. Miriam, Moses' sister, is on the bank of the Nile watching him go down the river. She sees Pharaoh's daughter lift him from the basket. And in a God-inspired moment, she goes, Do you need a wet nurse? For this child? Why, of course. And I'm sure there were plenty of Israelite women who had breast milk with no baby to feed because they had had their son thrown into the Nile. But, of course, Miriam was thinking about her mother. And so that baby was brought back to her home and life for several years as she nursed him, loved him, and taught him the ways of God. And like Joseph, these circumstances would also be worked together for the greater good of the people of Israel, giving rise to the exodus from Egypt, one of the most important events in all of human history. And another example we can find, brethren, is the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. We're familiar with that story, I believe. Naomi, we know the wife of Elimelech, had lived a life of relative ease and wealth in Bethlehem. But famine came to the land and caused her and her husband to make the difficult decision to leave all that behind and travel to Moab. Now Moab was the land of one of Israel's fiercest and most hated enemies. And yet they were reduced to going there because of this famine. What pain Naomi must have experienced. 
Once there, her sons married Moabite women, even though the Torah prohibited such unions. I'm sure that wasn't pleasant for her. And finally, her husband and both sons died, leaving her in this alien land with no provision because, you see, brethren, women at that time without some man to take care of them, quite frankly, had no other options. That's the way it was at that time. No son, you know, usually if a, if a husband died, then the son would take care of his mother. But she had lost both husband and sons. And so she returned to Bethlehem, humiliated, discouraged. But the hand of God lifted Naomi from her circumstances, working all things together for her good. You see, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who wouldn't refuse to leave her, unlike there was another daughter-in-law that when she said, if you want to go back to your father's house, off she went, but not, not Ruth. Ruth stayed with Naomi. And Ruth, as we know, ultimately became the wife of Boaz. And thus Naomi's comfortable future was assured. She had a family again. Enjoying the role of grandmother to Obed and eventually to King David himself. Naomi's contribution on a universal level is even more important because, you see, God used her and her circumstances to solidify the place of Gentiles in the genealogy of the Messiah. You see, Ruth was a Gentile. Brethren, like sages and scholars before us, we may sometimes grapple and I'm sure we do, with the meaning of Romans 8.28. All things work together to the good, to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But brethren, our God and his book are timeless and unchanging, and together they bring a clear message for us today. You see, because the story of Joseph shows us there is no deliverance without bondage. Job proves that there is no healing without sickness. And Jochebed and Naomi, no joy without the knowledge of misery. The Apostle Paul, going back to Romans, tells us throughout that important epistle that without evil, there would be no recognition of good. And without sin, no understanding of righteousness. Brethren, the awesome fact is, as believers sons and daughters of God Most High. It is clear to me, and I hope it is clear to you, that no matter what our situation might be, it is neither random nor pointless. Because the sovereign God of the universe, the maker of all things, has told us that our circumstances have purpose. We might not understand it at the time. It may seem difficult at the time. But we are assured that whatever it is, its ultimate purpose is to transform us into His likeness and to impact our communities and even our world with the knowledge of him. That's our destiny. 
That's our promise. How good is that? 